Hi everyone, this is Bolaj on Arby's Gadget Reviews. It's been a while and I haven't really had much time to post anything on this channel, but recently I got an interesting opportunity as Skoda offered me to review their latest 1A scale supercar, the Mercedes-Benz AMG 1. This set is very interesting as it's officially licensed by Mercedes-AMG and also by Michelin, so let's take a closer look at it. The box has a pretty cool high quality design with a lightly embossed image on the front, the original car can be seen on the side and the Mercedes logo on the top. On the back there is another view with some interesting details about the features. As you can see, this is a motorized set, which isn't my preferred choice at this scale, but let's see what we get. The inner boxes also look great, we can see the huge custom rims, more on that later. There are 5 numbered boxes, one for the rims and tires, and here is the hefty manual. The inner side of the box has another cool photo and nice attention to detail. Ok, so we get two books, the first one is mostly legal stuff and some instructions for the remote and the battery box. The big manual looks great, it feels high quality, and as a true licensed product it contains a lot of interesting information about the real car, some cool details recreated with bricks, and even more comparison pictures with the real car, quite an extensive section. We get some thoughts from the designer as well. The steps themselves are in the usual Kada style, a bit more crowded than the Danish version, but we will see how that affects the building experience. Let's get started. The first box contains a few number one bags, but also lots of electronic components and a few special parts that will probably be needed later. Here is the assembly at the end of the first phase. We have the rear axle with a differential and also a central differential, a nice suspension setup, one motor at the rear and a six cylinder fake engine. The build has been pretty dense so far, and as usual everything is black and grey, which really isn't my thing. We've reached the end of the second phase and the chassis is taking shape. As you can see, there are two motors connected by a differential. The car will have the interesting option of using one or two of them for higher speed. Smaller additional motors were also installed for the additional functions. Phase 3 consists of two sections. In the first, we added the front axle, although the suspension is not quite finished. I'm building the two-wheel drive version so the front wheels are not connected, because according to the designer this one has the best performance. The steering motor is also installed along with the lights and this new distribution box. Cable management was a real pain here, I tried to squeeze all those stiff cables under the servo, I couldn't really put this block in place. We also added a pullback motor that will simulate the curse system, I'm curious to see how it works. The next stage is finished and I have to admit that the experience here was frustrating, at least for me. There were tons of cables to run, and the instructions were a bit confusing in places, I really hate cable management. As you can see, the lights have a lot of wires in the front, the back is similar, and then everything had to be connected to the battery box. Oh, and there are splitters with different cable lengths, I didn't realize that until I had already installed the wrong one a dozen steps earlier. The front part is more or less done now, we have a lot of complex surfaces with different angles, and the whole thing is already amazingly stable. In the following phase we cover the back part. There are some huge custom elements for the air scoop and the fin, and you can see the real strength of this set, which is sculpting with these Technic style elements. It has some very complex shapes at odd angles, but everything is surprisingly sturdy and looks great too. We are quickly approaching the end of the build, here is one of the doors, again with some funky angles all around, you can see it has some complex internals, but it's pretty sturdy too. And here is one of the highlights of the set, the printed tires. I have another video on the main channel where I analyze all the new parts, I recommend you to watch it to get more details. All the wheels are mounted, now all we need is this nice printed plug with some impressive data about the AMG one, and we are done. The car looks great from all angles, the panels flow nicely everywhere, it really has a very impressive presence. The printed tires look awesome, and the rims have a great look as well. The car only has printed parts, aside from the stickers on the connectors for color coding. There aren't many printed pieces, but they look good. Honestly, I'm not sure Kada's new curved panels make much difference, but the designer did a good job with all the odd angles, especially behind the front wheel and at the rear. Everything is surprisingly sturdy, there are only a couple of loose elements, like the rear view mirrors or this flex axle here that just plugs into the pinholes without any reinforcement. Now let's take a look at the features. The battery box is accessible here, it pairs with the remote automatically. To charge it you have to take off this panel section, the plug is a bit difficult to reach. You can use this lever to drive forward and reverse, and all the lights come on when the car is moving. There's a reason I'm showing this with the car lifted, more on that in a moment. 
The steering is still not proportional, apparently the motors themselves have not been updated with the new connector system. This is unfortunate, I really hope Kada will be able to release a proper servo with a proportional remote in the future. These two buttons here control the doors and the rear spoiler together. The spoiler goes up when the doors are closed and it goes down when the doors are open. You will have to get used to the sound of the actuator clutches though, since the actuators reach their endpoints earlier than the doors. The interior is nice and detailed, although it's hard to see anything with the black on black design. We have printed gauges and a nice brick wheel steering wheel. Since it turns along with the wheels and there is no manual function, it can be centered thanks to a pin connection. There's independent suspension on all four wheels, the suspension travel is longer in the front than in the rear. There are still two buttons on the remote for cool party tricks but unfortunately some flaws as well. Let's recap the drivetrain setup. We have two motors here connected by a differential and the pullback motor coupled to the second one. When we operate the drive lever, only this motor is engaged and drives the wheels. When the car is lifted it works, but let's see what happens when I put it on the ground. When I drive forward, the motor at the rear winds up and locks the pullback motor, so that output of the differential is blocked and the power eventually goes to the wheels. The vehicle is slow, but it's moving. But what happens in reverse? As you could see, the wheels turn backwards when the vehicle is in the air, since these are the outputs with the least resistance. But unfortunately the situation changes when the car is on the ground, because in this case, the rear motor drives the front motor instead of the wheels. This time the pullback motor cannot help, because it does not block in this direction. When I use the extra buttons mentioned earlier, this is exactly what happens. This button alone is supposed to win the pullback motor, and when we push it forward, its power is released and the second motor is also engaged. This is the curse system, and I really like the concept, at least in theory. In reality, you always have to push the button too to be able to drive backwards, and if you want to reach a decent speed, you should use the second motor for the normal drive as well. I had this verified with another builder and he also had this challenging. According to the designer, reverse should work with a single motor, maybe the resistance in my drivetrain is greater, although I double checked all the connections and found no obvious errors. Well as you can see the car can move, with the two motors the speed is fine considering the size and weight of the vehicle and fortunately it's pretty sturdy so you won't lose many parts driving it around. But unfortunately the really interesting technical aspects of the drivetrain are more theoretical than practical at this point. So let's sum it up. We got a fully licensed and motorized 1.8 scale hypercar for 275 bucks. That sounds like a great deal and it really is mostly. The car looks very nice, has great details and clever paneling all around. I really like the licensed tires, although you have to be careful with the prints as they are less durable than the older LEGO ones. What I don't like as much is the motorization. Too many cables are needed, the right arrangement is tedious and the functions don't really work well. From a conceptual point of view they are interesting, especially the curse system, but play-wise they don't make any difference and you can hardly use the drive function of the single motor. I still think that the motorization is a gimmick at this scale and size, it's too big to play with properly, no one will drive it around the house more than a few times. It would be better if it had a stand to put on to demonstrate how the drivetrain works, but I would still prefer a manual version with mechanical functions. Kada's new electronic system seems to be a step backwards, it doesn't offer any new functions, but takes away the stackability of the connectors and we still don't have proportional steering. I am not a fan of the all black interior and the use of black pins. LEGO uses color coding for a reason, because it's very hard to distinguish the parts during building. The quality of the pieces has been improved a lot and I'm really happy about that. The new parts may have come out of necessity, but can offer some interesting building combinations in the future. The instructions are ok for the most part, although they have a few errors here and there, and sometimes explain a lot of things at once. I think this set has a different target audience than the 1A scale LEGO models, which are designed to be enjoyable for everyone, including beginners, but this one is really for black belt builders. Kada has a very specific target audience with this vehicle and I think those people will like it. I don't see the point in comparing it directly to the LEGO releases, as they have different building styles and concept. Yes, the official price of the Kada model is much lower, but the street price won't be that much different in the future I suppose, and I still don't think it's entirely fair to compare prices. I may go into detail in another video, but I would compare this to the automotive industry, where you can buy original parts from one manufacturer at a higher price, 
or third-party components with similar or even enhanced functionality at a lower price, and there are multiple reasons for that. So, if you don't mind building with a single color or even prefer it, you like the look and want to have motorized functions, I think you won't be disappointed. I wouldn't recommend this set if you don't have much building experience though. I really like the direction Kada is taking with the new releases. The improvement in the piece quality is more than welcome, and I like the effort to clean up their parts portfolio. I hope there will be some improvements and useful features in the electronic parts, and if they focus a bit more on the usability of the implemented features, I'm sure they will have many satisfied customers. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section, folks. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, watch it, and if the demand is high enough, I might check out some other interesting new releases as well. See you next time, bye bye.